Are you an Australian digital tech company interested to know more about the opportunities for your business in ASEAN? In this five-part series, Austrade, along with our guest speakers, will cover the key considerations for entering the market. If you'd like to know more and to visit the series, please see the links below. Hello and welcome to the Digital Trade in Southeast Asia Masterclass, being delivered in partnership with Austrade, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Trade and Investment Queensland, AsiaLink Business and Chamber of Commerce and Industry Queensland. Before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to Elders past and present. My name is Elisa Henderson. I am the Trade Start Advisor for Brisbane North Region and Principal Trade and Investment Officer at Trade and Investment Queensland. This masterclass is a five part series designed to give Australian tech businesses an insight and understanding into the scale of the opportunities in Southeast Asia and provide you with a sense of how to successfully enter and navigate the region if you are considering expanding into the ASEAN market. We will explore insights on the realities, threats, demands and nuances of Southeast Asia's digital landscape to help you make sense of the complex regulatory frameworks in the region. Throughout this series, you will hear from some key impressive speakers, including Dr. Peter Lovelock, an expert on digital trade based in Singapore, Austrade, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, IP Australia, as well as Queensland company Entersoft, a cybersecurity tech company scaling rapidly in Southeast Asia and recently a participant in Austrade's landing pad in Singapore. To start off with digital technology exports to ASEAN part one, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Lovelock, CEO of Specialist Technology Research Consultancy, TRPC, an IIT and comms oriented think tank based out of Singapore to speak about the opportunities across the region more broadly. Peter is an expert policy advisor on issues including the digital economy, cloud computing, mobile markets, new media, digital finance services, as well as being a strategic business advisor to leading global companies and various governments around the region. In recent years, Peter has provided advice on digital commerce and payments to eBay, Visa and PayPal, on cloud computing to digital corporations like Microsoft, AWS and Google, built and launched regulatory sandboxes in PNG, constructed a real-time real payments network for Myanmar and drafted data classification regulations for Indonesia. Thank you very much for being here today, Peter. I'd like to start by thanking Austrade, DFAT and AsiaLink Business. So let me get let me jump in and get started straight away. The opportunities, challenges and diversity of digital trade in ASEAN and the ASEAN markets. But what is digital trade? How are ASEAN market states and ASEAN overall delivering digital trade? How are they developing digital trade and how does this di differ from the digital economy developments we're seeing in front of us? How significant is that opportunity? And what are the challenges that we're seeing before us? So what should you be taking away from these conversations today? Well, the policy and regulatory landscapes in ASEAN and ASEAN market states for digital and everything digitalization as it applies to economic development, social reach and trade. What are the challenges in doing so? What are the policy priorities and therefore the opportunities? And what is the actual landscape? What are some examples of what's working and what isn't working? But what do we mean when we talk about digital trade? We need to start by recognising that digital fundamentally changes the economics of economic interaction, commercial interaction and social interaction. It does this by lowering costs profoundly, sometimes to zero. Transaction barriers are lowered, SMEs automatically, instantaneously become micro multinationals, leveraging off the digital platforms that already exist, the Amazons, the Ebays, the Alibabas, to engage with a market that now is fully at their reach, be it the country, the region, or the world. And value chains are disintermediated. This means that you're not only directing your, your business to businesses and SMEs, but to individuals. Individuals are now businesses themselves, and this presents an opportunity of 1.3 billion people automatically some 650 to 680 million people in, in ASEAN and a concomitant number of businesses. That presents a massive opportunity automatically. It also presents a massive challenge because of the fragmentation and diversity that comes with that market. The diversity, the natural diversity of ASEAN market states is now extrapolated out 
across all of that opportunity. But there's a second point that's worth focusing on here. That data flows, digital flows, now account for a larger share of GDP growth than global trading goods. And that's even more true of our region. So in recent years, we have seen the absolute number falling of global trade in goods. We've seen a plateauing of global trade in services. Most of that take up is now being driven by the trade in data. Global trade in data is increasing exponentially and that is where all of the opportunity currently lies in terms of trade, growth in trade across our region. But what is digital trade? Well, this is where it gets a bit tricky. Digital trade is a complex issue, as simple as it sounds. There's many definitions no one yet settled on. E-commerce, digital economy, digital transformation, these are all terms that are used interchangeably with digital trade and there can be a problem there. They're not exactly the same. In fact, digital trade goes much further. And this is important for understanding how you enter these markets, what the issues are, what the challenges you're up against. We tend to think of digital trade as comprising four overlapping areas. The first is digital goods and services. Think of video telephony, think of email, these things that are naturally digital, which are going through the roof in terms of the amount of flows and interactions that tend to undercut and drive much of our communications and interactions these days. The second is tangible goods and services being delivered digitally. Think of e-books, think of travel online bookings, think of streaming videos and TV shows, things that were once tangible that are now getting delivered digitally and consumed digitally. The third is the digital enablers of trade. Uh, 5G communications, cybersecurity issues, digital identities. These are all increasingly part of the infrastructure. Things that we're all using to facilitate trade, to drive trade, to produce trade, to consume trade. And they function at each level of the value chain. The fourth bucket is the disruptive new technologies that have general purpose applicability across sectors, across jurisdictions. The AIs, the IoT, 5G, these things that are now becoming disruptors across all of our sectors. Now they're obviously overlapping, but this is a way of thinking about how digital trade is becoming all encompassing. There is a second point that is fundamentally important here. And that when we think of digital, many people think of those digital sectors. The things like streaming TV, streaming movies, things like artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles, but all of our economy, all of our social interaction is now driven by digital. Traditional sectors, agriculture, healthcare, logistics, these are all increasingly being digitalized. And in ASEAN, that's where much of the opportunity lies. Economies that are standardly seen as perhaps the second or third tier economies have the opportunity are, and are in fact leapfrogging ahead right now into areas or using digital technologies in these more traditional areas that previously were seen as much harder to crack. Agricultural sectors, fisheries is a big one in Indonesia that is increasingly being driven by data technologies, data usage, cloud computing and data analytics. If you want to participate in that market, that really is where the opportunity lies. Funding and financing the growth of these businesses through the way they deploy their payments and their payroll and their insurance is increasingly driven by digital payments and digital access to bank accounts, to payments channels, to distribution networks. Again, that is probably one of the easiest and richest points of entry into the markets. So where in, is ASEAN's focus in this? Well, this is where ASEAN can be quite a, a conflicting beast for people to participate in. The focus that it has shown to digital over recent years and increasingly so is quite strong and quite profound. We see here a list of the areas that ASEAN is focused on. The ASEAN Declaration on Industry Transformation to Industry 4.0. In other words, the Master Plan on IR 4.0. The Framework on Digital Data Governance, the ASEAN Digital Integration Framework and the Action Plan that goes with that, the DFAP, the Cybersecurity Co Cooperation Strategy, the Financial Inclusion Framework. Let me just run back through those quickly and flag what they really mean. 
the IR 4.0 master plan, a focus on the 10 ASEAN market states trajectory and plans towards digital transformation, where the money is getting focused and spent as they make their respective journeys to digital transformation and how ASEAN aligns those. Digital data governance, transfer mechanisms, how privacy regimes and data regimes that are legislatively defined in each state will be able to talk to each other, how your data can adequately and safely be used in each of the market states. This is a big focus for ASEAN. The DIF, the Digital Integration Framework and the DFAP that goes with it is the roadmap for how e-commerce, digital uptake, digital uh, uh, development is happening all across the region. The cybersecurity focus and framework and master plan focuses on the robustness and safety and trust across ASEAN that's needed to define a single digital economy, which is the focus of AEC, the Economic Cooperation 2025. And the ASEAN financial framework that goes far beyond inclusion that talks now about seamless transaction flows at zero cost between each of our 10 market states and has already started between economies such as Thailand and Singapore. Let me flag the other aspect of this though. ASEAN is often seen as ephemeral, a talk shop, where a lot gets talked about but very little gets done. I would challenge that quite strongly. That is very true and there are meetings galore in ASEAN and it is a very, very difficult uh, beast to work your way through. On the other hand, many of us have taken initiatives that were getting focused in other multilateral forums, the APEX, for example, and refocus these in ASEAN because we have the chance to get things done because there is a focus in this region of finding regulatory frameworks and business enablers that work and then taking them back into APEC, into WEF, into OECD. The transfer mechanisms, the cybersecurity regimes, the data classification frameworks that are getting developed in ASEAN will get repositioned as regional and global frameworks for use. It behooves you to understand these and get involved in them. But the other aspect of this is that with every ASEAN initiative, you have to have a country take the lead. There is nothing that ASEAN itself leads on. If there is an initiative taken, a digital data governance framework that will be driven by a member state, there is always a member state that leads. And in fact, if you want to understand all of the opportunities and initiatives you have to dive into the various ASEAN market states, digital plans or master plans, and we see a list of them here. I won't linger too long, you have a lot of detail here, but these digital master plans are the same as digital master plans the world over. Some of them are master plans, they sit on shelves. Some of them have aspects of terrific importance, but all of them, relate to the funding drivers that are going in right now. They direct you to where the money and resources are being allocated by government and spent. And in terms of the priorities, the priority sectors, the priority businesses, the favoured opportunities, they are a roadmap for where you can focus for early opportunities or significant traction. So let me take that and dive into a few of the developments, few of the opportunities specifically in each of the market states or some of, a selection of each of these uh, market states. Singapore, obviously the leader, well out in front in so many of our digital developments, but that was because eight, nine years ago, Singapore took a conscious decision to move from being a financial regional hub to being the regional data hub and has gone after that a goal very, very assiduously. It's focused on setting the frameworks, on setting the rules of the road. It focuses on setting the trade digital rules, on, on setting the processes as much as the actual developments themselves, but it has significant for, core focuses on artificial intelligence, on digital banks, on cryptocurrency. Indonesia, the big kahuna in the room, the emerging giant of the region, and it wants to be seen as the giant and the leader in the region. It is very focused on that regional leadership role and it is focused on soft power. It is taking a much more serious commitment to participation in the multilaterals, participation in digital trade talks, participation in abiding by rules at some greater degree. 
It focuses right now on increasing foreign direct investment. It needs to get its revenue base up. And that includes things like digital tax. Very focused on areas around e-commerce, digital currency, and the growth and birth and growth of digital unicorns right now, of which we already have six, but the president has announced we will have 12. Malaysia. Malaysia this year, 2020, is its APEC year, and it is focused up until the recent developments around the coronavirus very, very heavily on trying to promote some degrees of leadership that will come out in digital for the 21 APEC economies and overlaying that with their ASEAN focus. It's focused on infrastructure developments, both hard, the networks and the cost issues, and the soft, the skill sets, the civil services and the bureaucracy. This is a new government that is still learning its way, and that presents many opportunities for participation. And so it is quite heavily focused on education issues and labor issues that would allow them to leap ahead compared to their regional neighbors, and certainly in cooperation with Singapore. The Philippines focused on content, on data flows, on business process outsourcing opportunities. It is still the second BPO market in the world, and that drives a lot of its focus. It has a huge foreign worker population, and that drives 10 to 12% of GDP through remittance flows. Again, this is all falling into digital channels right now. And therefore, it's focused heavily on the regional integration that would drive the cost participation for those people, those businesses around Asia down as low as possible. Vietnam, it is Vietnam's ASEAN year in 2020, and they too are taking that very, very seriously. They're focused on delivering the DFAP, the Digital Integration Framework Action Plan, with some real key takeaways, including what's known as the ASEAN Digital Integration Index. And they will focus where, therefore, ASEAN sets its work plans for the next three years. Vietnam will do as Vietnam always does and overlay its personal preferences, so to speak, on that regional push. And that includes mobile connectivity, it includes security issues. These are fundamental to driving the Vietnam opportunity in the next five to 10 years. And you can expect to see those really washing through the ASEAN priorities. And therefore also those transfer mechanisms, data transfer, privacy transfer, enablement. They're faltering along interesting lines, cybersecurity priorities and, and uh, imperatives versus digital delivery and their demographic equity. This is a hugely young, mobile savvy population that is moving very, very fast. That presents its own opportunities. And of course, they're rushing up against a crunch of capacity and capability. Get in and work with Vietnam right now. And the payoff over the next 10 and 20 years stands to be profound. Thailand is heavily focused on smart cities. Uh, Next-gen manufacturing to try to lift its traditional manufacturing bases, the cars, the steel production that has uh, flawed and, and pushed through ASEAN over the last 25 years is now being pushed over to next generation manufacturing. Japanese, Chinese, European investment is focused on the smart cities operations. But much of that has got very conflated with real estate issues. So get in with particular IoT developments, particular connectivity and communications opportunities that have a regional base to them. And Thailand is very open for business. Also very focused on e-commerce. Thailand has seen one of the most underreported and successful e-commerce pushes globally. Based off QR code deployments, subsidized QR code deployments, and by subsidized, I mean the government backed three banks to go out there and enable people to make free transactions forever. If you make a transaction of less than 5,000 baht, it costs you nothing. And that has put a whirlwind of opportunity across mom and pop stores throughout Thailand and been mar marvelously successful and for some reason highly underreported. This shows you what can be done in ASEAN right now, but it also shows you the diversity of focusing not only on those headline areas, but on the drivers for each of these markets. Put up a slide here I'm not gonna linger on of the big companies in that you know globally, you know all of these players, but there are two points just to leverage from here. The first is the fun one. Um, these companies which 20 years ago did not exist in any form and up till about 12 years ago, most of them didn't really exist or didn't exist substantially. Uber, the world's largest taxi company that owns no vehicles. Skype, the world's largest voice network that has no network. Alibaba, 
the world's largest and most rapidly growing e-commerce platform that owns no inventory. Netflix, the world's biggest TV, sh TV network now that owns no cables. These are, these are flag bearers for the new economy. Um, but people think that once that they become too big, they become dominant and too big to fail. There is lots of issues around competition policy because of the strength that these companies have brought to our region. But look at this slide. How many of these companies do you know? You need to know all of these. In our region, we have competitors, giant killers who can stand toe to toe with each of these. The grabs that were able to beat Uber at their own game regionally. Each of these sectors has a regional equivalent that stands competitive to the big players globally. And that is somewhat under-recognized still. It's a huge opportunity to partner with these companies or see where they're seeing opportunity in their markets that they leverage regionally. And therefore, the focus of an ASEAN digital regional economy is something they are all very, very focused on. This is their backyard and they will beat out the dominant companies where they are able. There are three uh, parameters that drive this each and every time. We see an Uber, an Airbnb, uh, Netflix come into the market. And the first thing that happens is a company will say, well, that's operating in English and we have different languages. We need to be able to operate in our country's language. And so you get a language overlay that happens. You have a competitor that jumps up and says, we'll do the same thing, but it'll be in our language. Then the second thing that happens is the degree of support that needs to come through. We're gonna to need to support based on our culture, based on our characteristics. And then the third is the service layers that come over this. Now we can make some real money. We've challenged Netflix or Uber or Airbnb. Um, or the big uh, MOOCs, the big education online providers at their own game. And we've done it by undercutting them, selling a bit cheaper. Netflix and iFlix was the classic battle here. Netflix at $10.99 a month for all the videos that you could consume. iFlix, a regional startup, did exactly the same model using Asian films and Asian TV shows and charged $3.99 a month. It was no brainer for many people in the ASEAN region. That was something that spoke to them and it was far cheaper. But once you then overlay the services on top of that, you can begin charging for all those services that come with it. Would you like some popcorn delivered with that movie you're consuming? We'll send that to you and we'll send it to you via Grab or Gojek. And this is where the economies begin developing at size in a way that's regionally competitive. And then you are focused on your customers, your customer delivery. And this of course is the strength of the local players on the ground in each and every case. But we must keep sight of the restrictions, the constraints and the regulatory difficulties that can still happen. In my world, the big players, the trade people all have a standard line. Data localization, bad free flow of data, good. It's a terrible line. We are way past this. We now live in a data localization world. It isn't going anywhere. Yes, it is problematic. And yes, we need to get clever about it. But if you walk into a market and say, I do not like your restrictive regulations, they are not going to listen to you. You need to get smarter about this. There have always been data restrictions. We all know national security restrictions. They will keep being in place, but we need to enable as much of the free flow of data as possible. What you see here is a snapshot of how these regulations are playing out around the region. And yes, we have some problems. Indonesia has one of the most restrictive data localization regimes still. We're working, we have a new re regulation in place. We have two new drafts about to come out that will further moderate this. The, the so-called GR82 has become GR71 that allows much greater flow of data from Indonesia into the region and into the world. Vietnam has its own cybersecurity regulations. Again, somewhat extremely problematic. And one to one side of ASEAN, we have India with terrible data localization restrictions coming through. And on top of ASEAN, we have China with similar problematic. These issues are there, but you need to get smart and work around them. You need to recognize what the differences are. And there is a need to ensure, particularly for SMEs, 
viability and protection against liability in each of these markets to be able to scale and sustain. And this is where working with Austrade, with DFAT, with AsiaLink Business becomes fundamentally important because you need the due diligence and you need a landscape of the regions you are walking into. And you must not assume that one market speaks to the whole region in these areas. These will be battles market by market at times. Again, I'm not going to linger on this next slide about digital, digital economy resilience. These are talking points for advocacy that are positive messages about why we enable the digital economy that push back against those more onerous digital localization restrictions. You know all of this, but let me focus more specifically on some of the real problems. Connectivity, logistics, education and skill sets. Connectivity, the access issues you need, network access to deliver on digital, reliable access, affordable access, interoperable access. This is where we're really taking the battles in a lot of ASEAN markets. And this is what enables the digital flows and the governments know it. And we are working fairly productively with most governments around the region on that issue. Secondly, logistics access. Cash still works across much of ASEAN. But that is, that's got a half-life that is shrinking rapidly. ASEAN will be one of the first regions to go fairly cash-free, fairly fast. And developments like coronavirus are only going to accelerate that transition remarkably. We will move to digital payments so fast it will take your breath away. And in markets like Myanmar, that thing is going to happen almost overnight, ironically. The last mile delivery issues around logistics, people with problems around addresses and IDs. And again, I throw those up because they are massive opportunities. Digital IDs is something ASEAN has focused on. And if we could have harmonized or interoperable digital IDs, you have a huge market at your footsteps. The skill sets and the readiness issues. Again, there is huge diversity and huge capacity gaps across ASEAN. That presents both a challenge in finding the skill sets in a particular market, but it's also a huge opportunity. And if there was one area that stands to be totally revolutionized through this impact and through the opportunities, it's the education sector. Again, I would point to some of the initiatives sponsored by DFAT and a lot of the work that AsiaLink, for example, does in sponsoring people-to-people -people connectivity around education initiatives based on digital platforms. It is a huge and underexplored opportunity. But if we don't get it right, the digital divide issues that still hamper growth in ASEAN will constrain us and constrain us all. That is our growth market. We need to get some of this correct. So let me give you a, a little bit of a focus on a few of the players to give some ideas of what works and at times what doesn't work. Grab and Gojek. Grab, loosely known as Malaysia or when it jumped ship from Malaysia to Singapore, Singapore's version of Uber. Um, a company that focused very, very succinctly on, as I said, underplaying Uber, targeting its rival and undercutting the rival very successfully and won, beat Uber. And in, in the end, Uber was sent packing from the market, sold down its share to Grab and moved out of ASEAN comprehensively. Gojek, known as Indonesia's version of Uber, somewhat incorrectly. It started in a similar ride sharing capacity, but very, very quickly worked out the strength of these digital platforms and moved away from simple ride sharing or bike sharing focus to food, to massage, to pedicure, to manicure, to pharma delivery, to everything you could think of. Here was a logistics solution point that would deliver you anything you want in both directions. It would take you to your medical appointments and deliver the medical back to you when you're at home. This has gone wildly successful, but the two of them have played a rather different game. Gojek focused heavily on Indonesia, its strength point to go regional, Grab knew it had to be a regional play because this is a game of scale and scope. It needed the volume play. And so they played it somewhat differently. Grab very, very cleverly went and aligned with regulatory differences in each market. It walked in and went to the regulator and said, we need you to regulate us. We know you're nervous about ride sharing and the gig economy. We know that that'll create problems of trust. So let us help you regulate us so you feel secure. Meanwhile, of course, Uber was saying, we can't be regulated. Bugger off, you can't touch us. And with that, Grab won trust facilitation into the marketplace and was able to undercut Uber on a degree of trust and working with the government and with the market. Gojek has started to employ similar techniques, but it shows you how you can 
use these opportunities in each of the markets. What it also shows is that there is no one size fits all, but that people get very comfortable with trust facilitators that they begin to buy into. So a Gojek may present a lot of different markets and a lot of different opportunities, but you know what you're going to when you go to Gojek. Another good example of what can work is iStocks in Singapore. It's a good example for a couple of reasons because it shows how to work with government. And it does this on two ways. Singapore very early on, despite being very uncomfortable around cryptocurrency, blockchain and digital currency, made its, made its position very, very ambiguous and said, maybe, maybe not. We'll focus, we're not sure that we'll legitimize. iStocks, a blockchain based startup, walked into the government and said, let us work with you. In fact, let us be your experimental face. And that brings the second point of how to work with government, the use of sandboxes, regulatory sandboxes. They very quickly put themselves into the sandbox that had been started up by the Monetary Authority of Singapore and said, you can watch us. Give us a little bit of room to move around cryptocurrency development. Let us show you the market opportunity, the market appetite. Let us show you where the gaps in the regulatory infrastructure and regime are. And you can keep looking over our shoulder so that we can work on, on solving those problems together, but it's still ours. We prove that we're safe. We prove there's no systemic threat. We prove there is market demand. Once we graduate from the sandbox, you let us go after that market, which means, of course, they get a remarkable head start on a lot of their competitors coming out into that market. And think of this as we flag Singapore is a leader in this, re in this area for the region. The rules that are getting set around many of these issues in Singapore are being therefore copied and replicated around the region. They had therefore got a head start on a lot of the regional blockchain developments. And as governments have moved to blockchain incorporation, there you have a young startup who is now front of rank when governments start putting out issues of help or tender bids for participation. Those regulatory sandboxes have popped up all around the region. We have issues in the alignment of those sandboxes and that an issue for a different day, but those sandboxes present your way into the market in many cases, particularly around some of those regulatory, um, not so much obstacles, but ambiguity. Two more, Kluke. Kluke, again, a good example because of the approach of recognizing not one size fits all, but being very, very clear on demographic. It has gone after that travel area and recognize that that's a platform for selling many, many different types of businesses and opportunities. Um, but what it does is focus on the different opportunities as not one size fits all, but being very clear on that front face entrance point. People will call that the branding or the customer trust or the, the front face, but it goes far further than that when it comes to digital trade and digital economy development issues. Think here of Amazon, you all know Amazon. But what the hell is that company? I'm still waiting for someone to tell me what Amazon is as a company. I've never seen a definition of Amazon that works in our normal understanding of a company. That company is everything. It's not one thing. But when you go to Amazon, when you say Amazon to people, people automatically know what you're talking about. There is a degree of trust, rightly or wrongly, that has been earned and that people buy into. The clukes of the world are very cleverly using that same strategy to say, you know what you get with Kluke, even though you could be doing three wildly different businesses by going through that front face. Again, it's a very clever use of scale and expansion across markets. Finally, let me finish on an Australian example, Quitch, for a demonstration of what's been done well in entering the Australian, the ASEAN market. Here is a company focused on the education learning sectors. Um, that has used the gamification approach, which I am a huge fan of. Things that focus on engagement rather than static delivery of giving you an app or a platform, actually engaging with your customers, but even more quietly and more importantly, moving forward, the data that you collect, the behavioral understandings by working in that kind of gamification approach. We can tweak, we can see what changes over time. It's a very clever way of basing a model, but more importantly to their business success, what they show is how to work with partnerships in lo with local players in starting in Singapore, moving out to Malaysia and then around the region. We will target a key demographic and a key partner. For example, as we move out of the core education space, we target the hospital sector and work with a key hospital partner there. 
It's a very smart approach to working when you, with, with ASEAN and into ASEAN when you have limited resources. Find a local partner that will benefit from your technology successes or your know-how and build into their point of pain. Let me finish up by leaving you with a couple of uh, key thoughts for engaging into and with ASEAN. Um, the partnerships focus becomes important. Understand your markets, not only the partners, but the markets you are going into. And that brings to the second point, that due diligence becomes crucial. Again, in a digital world, due diligence takes on a different nature than it has traditionally. You are looking at a huge array of new regulations, rules and landscapes coming up. And as I said at the very outset, digital is by definition cross-sectoral and cross-jurisdictional. A bank, a fintech player going into a new market is not going simply into the financial sector as they once were. They need to understand the impact across an array of sectors and that gets overlaid with the challenge of going into these various markets. You need a partner to work with you and guide you on the legal issues, the regulatory issues, the financial requirements, the compliance requirements. The starting point here, of course, is going to be Austrade, DFAT, AsiaLink. For Australian companies looking to engage with ASEAN, I can't stress that enough. And finding a player who gives you a window into or a telescoping into both the region and a particular market and a particular partner at any given time is fundamentally important. And there are a lot of us working across the region. So reach out, touch us with these questions and these contacts, whether you're in the fisheries, the forestries, the agricultural sector, labor mobility, education, hospitality, these digital opportunities from me and Marta Singapore are profound. But reach out and work with people who understand the markets and then get involved. Thank you very much.